What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another Vintage Cube Draft. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what you're here for, uh, Kerwit, uh, Kerwit from the chat, has written some fanfic about Mike B here, and we're gonna read some of it online here, and we're gonna read, we're gonna break it up into, into several videos. So we'll try to complete it. And uh, several if you, videos. If you guys don't like it, you can skip past it towards the drafting section. But. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's 1440, and I'm, I'm, I would never, I would never get 1080p monitors anymore. That's I, I cannot go back to 1080p ever again. And uh, it's a, it's the new Samsung. Anyway, without further ado, Mike B fanfic, <laughs> Delaware. I am, as you know, Michael B. There has been much debate as to the actual name behind the B, but unfortunately, your guess is as good as mine. I was named by my father, and he gave me his name. However, he took no he took part of it with him. You might at this point be asking, why do you not simply look at your birth certificate? A reasonable question, but it would just tell you what I have told you. B. <laughs> just a letter, that is all that is written there. Perhaps that is all that was meant. But if there is more, I will probably never know. We will dive into the reasons for that later. For now, feel free to explore the possibilities of B. You know, part of that was true. <laughs> So he got that, got one thing. I did get this that. This isn't name entirely from, inaccurate. I did get the name from my grandfather, but you know. Oh, Grandpa, Grandpappy Michael? Yeah. Let me. I grew up in the most average of places, Delaware. It is neither exciting nor scary. <clears throat> it is. What are you doing? No, I'm not, nothing. Apparently, I grew up in Delaware. And, this uh, is fan fiction, Michael. It's not <laughs> fan fact. Unbelievable. It is neither exciting nor scary. It is not beautiful or ugly. It just is. You yourself probably would have never heard of it, were it not for the butt of a joke in a movie Wayne's World, if you are old enough to have heard of that movie. We're in Delaware. Yeah, I do remember that. That's a great joke. If you are not, I suggest that you view it on whatever futuristic content system is now available to you. It would be listed under Classics of the 20th Century. Despite its rather mundane atmosphere, Delaware was a fine place to spend my formative years. Not being distracted by the high expectations of living somewhere like New York or Los Angeles, or dealing with the problems that come with more poverty-stricken areas, I was able to focus on me. This gave me a great foundation for all that you will read about. <laughs> this is fantastic. <clears throat> this is amazing. There are perhaps three main components to all children's formation. Parent, environment, school, and friends. We will get more to the parent in the coming chapter. For now, we will discuss the latter two. I went to Southern Elementary School. Perhaps it's, it's self informed <laughs> What does Southern Elementary School mean? It's the name of the school you went to, Oh, man. the name of the school. Okay. It's, <laughs> it's just what it's called, my man. Perhaps it's self a foreshadowing. I have never had a high opinion of pre-college education. Pre-college? <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, pre-collegiate education. Most of what is taught is done is done so at such a slow pace, it's a wonder anyone can remember anything by the time the next topic is presented. But, as you well know, elementary school is less about education and more about socialization. And at this task, Southern Elementary covered the basics. Might makes right, personality is as much capital as cash, and... Let's discuss some instructive in interactions. There are some very minor individuals in my life that will appear, but I cannot remember them well enough to know if their names are correct. It does not matter. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <clears throat> Jimmy was your quintessential schoolyard bully, loud, obnoxious, and he pretty much got away with everything. As is normally the case with such individuals, they rarely ever actually physically abused anyone. But the rare occasion was enough to put weight behind their threats. Fear is a powerful motivator. Jimmy certainly knew how to wield his power, attracting a group of friends, mostly out of desire to not be attacked, of other school children. One wants to assume that when such children become adults that their behavior will no longer be tolerated, and they will find themselves ostracized from society. Unfortunately, this is usually not the case. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause right here. Okay. I want to know what that whole paragraph had to do with anything at all. It basically said absolutely nothing. What'd you find? We're talking about Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> We're not done, man. This is. Are you I need, saying that I need to know more about Jimmy? Well, then you gotta give it time. Okay. <laughs> you gotta give it time, man. Ooh. This this is titled "I Lost My Father to Cigarettes." <laughs> On a particularly cold morning in April, I woke up and my mother was sitting by herself eating some pancakes. This. Is <laughs> 
<laughs> like you do. Like you do. This was unusual as she did not usually eat breakfast alone. I asked her. <laughs> well, you don't eat breakfast alone, Mom. I asked her where my father was, but she just kept eating the pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, taking it back, taking it back. <clears throat> I asked her where my father was, but she just kept eating the pancakes. After a little while of her not answering, I just got myself a plate of pancakes and sat, <laughs> sat down at the t He's like, eh, I guess I'll just eat some pancakes too. After a few minutes had passed, she looked up and said he went out to get cigarettes. I didn't think much of it aside from the oddity of her waiting so long to tell me. But I didn't feel like pressing her more, and I really didn't think anything was particularly wrong. Later I went to school, as normal, and then came home, as normal. When I returned home, my mother was still sitting at the kitchen table where I had left her. This could have been a coincidence, but it did not seem like one. What's wrong? Have you been sitting in the same place all day? I asked her. She sat there for a little while, while not really acknowledging my presence, but eventually looked up. <clears throat> I don't think your father is coming home. <laughs> her delayed utterance caught me off guard, and I was not sure how to respond. Like, ever? This was the best question I can think of, and in all honesty, not really a terrible one. One's father is not supposed to disappear forever. She did not respond to this question. Do you know where he went? Cigarettes. This was perhaps the last thing she said to me on the topic. And I have never pushed her further on it. For many years, I assumed my father had abandoned me. It was not till some time later in life that my mother's, my mother's story of him going to buy cigarettes may have just been some kind of code to stand in place of the actual truth, one that she could not handle, that my father had died of cancer. Perhaps she chose to believe that he had run away, which made it possible that he could someday return. To this day, I'm not actually sure which is the right answer. It seemed insane to me that he would have abandoned us. There is no prior indication that such a thing was a possibility. He was also not in the best health due to constant smoking, so cancer was not out of the question. We never went to a funeral, and no one ever talked about him. I will probably never know. You may be asking yourself, what makes him think his father died of cancer? That is a fair question, and the answer to that is not straightforward. In fact, it will seem crazy to you. I'm a scrober. <laughs> Jesus. The fact that anyone dedicated this amount of time to a fan <clears throat> is amazing. Oh man. Okay. I want to do one more, one more parrot, one more parrot, and then we'll just we'll save some parrot. more for the next video. I'll do one more parrot. A very sober scrober. I'm sure the first question you have is, "What's a scrober?" It's a question I had without knowing there was a word for it. We'll get to my discovery of it soon, but for now. Let's talk Scrober. The most succinct description is a Scrober can see through time. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <clears throat> Seems great, right? Well, it's not quite that simple. To see through time, a Scrober needs to get drunk. The more drunk you get, the further into the future you can see. But it's more complicated than that. The further out you look, the murkier things get. As your vision expands out into the future, you start to see other alternate timelines. Beyond a week, you can never be sure what you are seeing will actually happen. Much like the repercussions of getting drunk, hangovers are not pleasant. When a scrober wakes up from a drunken view of possible realities, you will see into the past until the effects of the alcohol wear off. This also works much the same way as seeing into the future. The higher the intensity of the hangover, the further back you see. On one occasion, I viewed a post-World War II Winston Churchill promise that every day would be Chicken Sunday. <laughs> I'm not sure what this means, but it's interesting to think about. Much like uh, the hangover side effect is what led me to believe that my father had actually died of cancer and did not run away. On particularly post-drunk morning, I woke up to a swirling haze of my childhood. Kitchen. These visions were not immersive things, like some, some out-of-body experience. I was just witness to the events that played out. My father was sitting at the table, coughing loudly, then just kind of slumped over. I sat there staring at this scene for what seemed like hours. I did not have the ability to stop the visions. Once you were in them, you stayed till so you let go. My mother eventually entered the room, took one look at him, and broke down crying. After the initial wave of grief had worn off, the expression on her face became angry. She grabbed the pack of cigarettes that now lay on the table next to his lifeless hand, and in a fit of rage attempted to tear the box in half. When she failed at this, she tore the pack open and began ripping up cigarettes. This was how the vision ended, and I came to on the floor next to my next to my bed. I sat on the floor for a few hours, pondering what I had seen. 
It was not the first time I had witnessed a scene of intense emotional anguish, but it was the first time it had been personal. I was left wondering if this had been my past or an alternate one. There were ways I could have found out, but sometimes it's easier to just not know. Such experiences are what led some scrollers to give up alcohol altogether. A bober, as they would come to be known. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. <clears throat> and that's, that's the first two pages of the Michael B. fanfic. The following chapter is called Selling Out. So what does one do with the ability to see into the future? The same thing you do with any advantage. Get rich. As someone who did not have a lot of money, I had to start small. Being able to see what stocks will do... There's, there's a couple of typos in here from Kerwitz, so you give know, you. I'm just yeah, it says give give you not gives you, so I'm trying to figure out if it's given gives. Um, so if I if I if I pause for a second, it's because I'm trying to I'm trying to get through the typos. Kerwitz, the writer, not the editor. I would probably edit this myself. Let's go back. Being able to see what stocks will do gives you the chance to capitalize on things like good earnings reports. You have to be careful when doing things like this to not attract too much unwanted attention. Taking some international losses combined with bigger gains is a way to accomplish this. But this further slowed down my accumulation of wealth. <clears throat> All right, we know I can't... Sp <laughs> All right, take it easy. Uh, it wasn't... I wasn't... I was more defending my own, uh, my own discretions here. Uh, I needed a way to amass capital quicker without drawing attention to myself. I did the only logical thing anyone in my position would do. I became a TV psychic. Well, not exactly. I started a psychic hotline and got an actor to be my media personality. After some TV appearances where I was in a van outside feeding my media personality visions into the future, my company's fame began to spread. The irony of most TV psychics is that they prove their ability to see the future by trying to tell you the past. Since I dealt mostly in the future, it quickly became apparent that I was a little different. I built out a hotline service using a call center of other lesser 2-bit psychics, the kind you see on street corners doing palm readings. This would not be my last experience with a call center, but we will get to that later. You might wonder if using this kind of person would lead to people feeling shortchanged, as they knew as they were exactly what the other services had to offer, but people have expectations. Also, I spent most of my days drunk monitoring my calls and feeding our operators small glimpses of their caller's future, which kept enough people having a good experience that the calls continued to flood in. All the drinking and money led to some serious partying. I would constantly have hangovers at my hang, hangers on over at my place. If you have to, if you have to drink, you might as well have company. During one of our parties, I met Bortina. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> it was a very unusual <laughs> It was a very unusual name, but I was drunk and she was pretty, so I didn't much care. We hit it off and spent a lot of time together, at least until I got to the point where I was so drunk I couldn't keep track of what was real and what was fake. I lost touch with her. As you might expect, this time in my life is not one that I remember a whole lot about, and neither was it good for my health. I realized after a few months of this that it would not be a long-term endeavor, but the sheer amount of money that I was putting in the bank kept me going for longer than I should have. Truthfully, had a very unfortunate series of events befallen me, it probably would have proved my end. The next chapter is called Rat Debt. <sighs> As you might expect, anyone determining that there is some sort of legitimacy to a psychic service, whether supernatural or not, would see the same benefit in it that I did. This led to a lot of people and organizations making regular calls asking for somewhat specific information. It became apparent to me quickly that this was happening, and I decided that these people needed to pay quite a bit more for this type of information. This is very shrewd of you. <laughs> this arrangement seemed quite fine for a long time, and I did not hear any sort of rumblings <clears throat> that this was any issue. After one week where I was particularly drunk, leading me to see visions of futures that were far, were too far out to be reliable, I was, <clears throat> I was one evening paid a visit by a man in a dark suit. This is ominous. I was laying in my sweat and alcohol stained bed where I spent most of my time when I was not working. I was also mostly drunk as I did not want to suffer the repercussions of sobering up. It was probably because of my drunken state that I did not realize the oddity of the large pack of rats that attended to the man in the dark suit. Hello Mike. It also did not strike me as odd that he knew my name, though it should have, as I spent quite a bit of energy trying to hide myself from the general public. I bet you're wondering who I am, or perhaps you are too drunk to care. We know quite a bit about you and your ability. Oh, uh, what? 
I'm not sure exactly what I said, but I'm sure it was unintelligible as my brain was still in the process of forming a coherent sentence. You see, my associates and I have been using your services for some time now. It was at this point that I became aware of the rats. The rats? I asked in the middle of his sentence, interrupting him seeming, seemed to annoy him. And the rats all started chittering. Yes, Mike, the rats. At this point, he made some chittering noises while directing his attention to the rats on the ground. He then waited for a second while the rats made more chittering noises and turned his attention back to me. You listen till I ask you a question, then you talk. You see, Mike, we have been using your advice to earn some money, but some advice you gave us recently turned out to be less than visionary. We are not happy. So what would you like to do about this? <clears throat> do you work for the rats or do they work for you? I could tell he was not happy about this question as he quickly covered the space from the entrance to where I was lying on my bed and punched me square in the face. <laughs> oh, my apologies. Let me be clear. After I ask a question, when it is your turn to speak, you answer the question. Since you have already paid the price for this out of turn question, I work for these gentlemen you see around me. Now then, your turn to answer my question. I didn't have anything to say. He waited a few minutes and then started talking. Well, let me tell you what it's going to be. We are taking your business and your money. How will you how how will you run the business if you can't see the future? It seemed like a legitimate flaw in their plan to be fair. They could have just run it like a normal scam psychic operation. That's part of the business. We are taking that too. He said this in a very matter of fact. He said this is very matter of fact, but I was not aware that this was even an option uh, unless they were planning on forcing me to work for them. You look confused. Are you going to keep me chained up? I was starting to get worried. No, we don't have any interest in you. We're just taking the power. How does that work? Before I could finish my sentence again, he punched me in the face again, and I was knocked out cold. Thank you. The next chapter. Starting over. I woke up sometime later in an alley somewhere. I'm not exactly sure when, or even if this was the same day. I didn't really keep track of what day it was before this. I would have to start keeping track. It was not realistic that I would be getting my company or my cash back, as we had previously discussed. There were some less than savory business taking place with my company, and it was probably best not to call attention to it. Time to start over. I would also realize that they had taken my ability to see the future. I was a common bober now. This was in some ways a relief. Being able to constantly see what may be coming was not good for my health. Finding a new job and place to live was not the easiest task. I had no money, and I had no marketable job skills. I also couldn't go around telling people that I had run a psychic hotline as that would just open me up to questions I didn't want to answer. Enemy MTGO, thank you for the resub. Really appreciate it during this, uh, this Mike uh, fanfic we're doing here. <laughs> After a few days spent out back at the Hungry Howie's, <laughs> I woke up and found another Bortina. I, found, I woke up and found Bortina staring down at me. It was perhaps one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. She was one of the few women I had gotten close to, even in this very brief time that we had spent together. And having her see me in such a state, I tried to look away. What happened? Are you okay? Her voice sounded of genuine concern, which was reassuring. I had expected it to have an air of derision. I don't know. I wasn't sure what to tell her. I certainly couldn't tell her I'm a psych about that my psychic abilities had been stolen by a pack of mob rats. Clearly, that would be ridiculous. How long have you been here? I think she was expecting the answer to this question to be in, a, in the hour range. Three, four days, probably? The answer clearly shocked her. Do you not have anywhere to live? I... I couldn't finish the sentence. You're coming with me. You can sleep on my couch. Even though the thought of this was painful to me, sleeping in the alley was more painful. So I went with her. Her place was small, but it was much better than the alley. It had heat and a bathroom, unlike the alley. There was also a distinct difference in the number of judgmental eyes staring at me before every person that walked by the alley eyed me, wondering what I had done to deserve such a horrible life. Now there was just one set of eyes, and while she probably did not harbor the judgmental feelings that I perceived she did, it did not lessen my experience. Bortina left for work every day, which left me time to sit and contemplate. After a few days of quiet, I decided to get a job. I went to the hungry Howies I had been sleeping behind and asked for a job. The manager recognized me and for some reason gave me a job. I had started again. <laughs> <clears throat> this is so long. <laughs> it's really long. All right, we're going to do one more for this one. It's called A Hungry Chap. The next chapter, A Hungry Chap. Working at a pizza store is certainly not glamorous, but it was a good job. 
The people I worked with were fun to be around, and that is one of the best things that you can ask for out of a job. There wasn't much of an opportunity for what you might call a career at this stage, though. I was not looking for that. One day, a man entered the store. I'm having a hard time thinking of words to describe this glorious individual. He had a jaw so square, I'm pretty sure I caught a glimpse of the 70s checking him out from the corner of my eye. His teeth, which I'm pretty sure were stolen from a dental catalog, gleamed and were full, on full display behind a million-dollar smile. He was dressed in business casual with a fitted shirt and some well-tailored pants. I was working the cash register, and he approached me and asked for plain pizza. This confused me. How could someone so magnetic eat something so plain? You don't seem to like a, you don't seem like a plain pizza kind of man. We have a delicious meat blasted pizza with a meat <laughs> stuffed crust. <laughs> Look at that meat blasted pizza. I'm not sure how someone how how <laughs> I'm not sure how I got this out of my mouth as I was a little starstruck. Ha ha! His laugh was like a caricature of a cheesy old timey movie. You make a fine pitch. I'll have your meat pizza. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. I'll have your meat pizza. At this point, his smile widened, which I'm not sure that was possible. He reached out to shake my hand. My name is Howie. Hungry Howie. <laughs> At this point, my <laughs> my name is Howie. <laughs> okay. Oh boy. At this point, my jaw dropped. I had heard that Mr. Howie. Admiral Agbar, <laughs> thank you so much for the reason. I really appreciate it, buddy. At this point, my jaw dropped. I had heard that Mr. Howie visited some of the stores, but I didn't really have a good idea of how likely this was. I like your moxie. You're oh working God. for me now. <laughs> and <it's... laughs> I like your moxie. I like your moxie, oh kid. Oh, my God. You're working for me now. And with that, I joined Hungry's team. His first name is actually Hungry. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I just composed myself. <sighs> okay, we're doing it. This was a far better job as you would as you would expect. I traveled with them a lot. We would regularly visit other stores. I also now had money to travel some, which was great because Bortina liked to travel. Did I mention that we were dating? The next chapter is Florida Man, which we'll get to in the next video. Keep keep tuning in, guys. Keep tuning in. <laughs> I still on a whole have no idea what this is about. <laughs> it's about you, man. It's about you. And now the next chapter, Florida Man. On a sunny July afternoon, Bortina and I left on a trip to Florida. It was a place that I had always wanted to visit. It seemed like a quaint place with old time values. The flight was uneventful. <laughs> the flight was uneventful and after landing and checking into a motel, we went out to sightsee. We walked around the small town we had decided to stay in. I don't recall its name, as Bortina had booked it. The town was folksy, real folksy, which is, I supposed, what we had come for. It was the kind of town that had one main street and all the stores were on it. There was a high school at the end of the main drag, and since school was out, teenagers in trucks driving all over the place. <laughs> this is more Midwestern than Florida. At this point, I saw what was perhaps the strangest thing I have ever seen. A man came running out of a store, followed closely by an alligator in a hot dog costume and a dog on a 4x4. Four four. I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. I didn't really have time to contemplate the deep meaning of this truly bizarre occurrence as the group of them swerved sharply and headed straight at us. I dove to get out of the way, but Bortina was stunned by what she saw. What, what, by what she was looking at and just stayed where she was. I tried to yell at her, but she did not move, and she was trampled by the man. The alligator in the hot dog suit stopped and did not follow after its previous mark, and instead looked down at Bortina. Then something horrible happened. The only description I can give is that it ate her soul. The alligator then jumped on the 4x4 with the dog and they drove off into a nearby forest, leaving me to cradle the now lifeless body of Bortina. Everyone in the town ignored what had just happened, so I took her body back to the motel room.
<laughs> Try to like. This is not a normal thing. After a few hours, I still had no idea what had taken place. It made no sense. I made a call to the next strangest thing that I knew. The next strangest thing that I knew, not knowing it would it would be any help. I called the rat mob. After describing what had happened, the rat man explained that it could be fixed, but I would have to make a deal with them. And after gaining my assurance that I would do whatever was necessary, they told me to wait where I was. A broken back. The next chapter. The rat man and a few rats appeared at my motel room the next morning. The rat man did not look pleased to see me, but did not say anything as he entered the room. Bortina was still on the bed. Well, let's do this. The rat man motioned to Bortina and the rats jumped up on the bed and got to work. Wait, what do I owe you for this? It started making me uneasy, but I wasn't about to back out. You and I will discuss that while my employers attend to the, my employees, my employers attend to the business at hand. Come outside with me. With that, he walked over to the door and opened it and motioned for me to go outside. Once we were outside, he closed the door. That gator stole her essence. Is essence like a soul? No, it's completely different. Stop asking questions. We can call it back, but we have to. We will incur costs in the process. You will have to make up those costs. Fortunately for you, you have something we want. Thank you. Anything. She doesn't deserve to die. Don't worry, we're already well underway. In addition, she won't remember you. This is necessary, but I don't enjoy seeing you. So we're doing this out of spite. <laughs> this isn't necessary. Oh my god, hold on. This isn't necessary, but I don't enjoy seeing you, so we're doing it out of spite. Wow, that's messed up. At, at this, the rats appeared at the window of the motel room. Looks like it's your turn. Before I could respond this, he knocked me out again. I woke up in a bed in the hotel room, and unsurprisingly, Bortino was gone. Then, the shocking thought of what they had taken from me had crossed my mind. I was not immediately sure what it was, but as soon as I tried to move, I knew. They took my spine. <laughs> in the days to come, I managed to acquire a cheap second-hand spine, though it was worn down and frequently broke. I would tape it back together when it did, and it frequently broke. I would tape it back together when it did. I also spent a lot of time pondering my future. Unlike the last time, the rats had not taken all my money, so I had a bit of resources to rely on, but I was not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. Pizza executive attaché is not the most lucrative position, but it also afforded me some time to find something new. I knew I could not go back to my old job. It would keep me in too close proximity to Bortina, and while she would not remember me, I did not want to run the risk of running into her. I called Hungry and told him that I needed to try something new. He didn't see anything wrong with that, and wished me luck in my endeavors. Staying in Florida seemed like an option. Maybe someday I would run into that essence stealing gator and I could enact my revenge. Helping the poor, the next chapter. <laughs> I settled in a city named Clearwater. It seemed like a nice place and not too folksy. I set out to meet some people and try to find a place to live. I noticed some people in a game store one Friday evening, so I went in. I just noticed some people in there. They were playing a card game called Magic. I had heard of the game, but never really played it. But despite my track record with real magic, this kind of seemed like it would be fun. So I sat down at a table with some nice gentlemen and they showed me how to play. What's your name? A silver-haired friendly man asked. <laughs> God. Mike B. I'm Frank. Nice to meet you. If you don't mind me asking, do you dye your hair that color? You don't seem to be old enough to have gray hair. It was probably an imposing question, but I was genuinely curious. Haha, <laughs> no worries. I was given anesthetics during back surgery, and this was a side of... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. I had a pretty big back surgery recently. This was somewhat of an understatement. Oh, what happened? Frank sounded genuinely concerned. A trait I react well to. Some rats took my spine. Ha ha ha, that's great. What did the rats want with your spine? Payment for my rat debt. Makes sense. At this point, we kept discussing and playing some cards. Later, they asked where I was staying and invited me to sleep on their couch for the evening. This ended up turning into weeks, and eventually I just started paying rent. I got a job at a call center, a call back earlier, from earlier in my story. It wasn't great work, but it paid, and I enjoyed spending time with my new friends. My back still hurts. Maybe someday I'll get a brand new spine, but for now, I live with what I have. From time to time, I still think about Bortina, wondering where she is and what she's doing. 
I took a trip once to my old town to make sure she was actually alive. I had not seen her since the accident. I found her in a coffee shop sitting with some, old, some people I assume were her friends. She looked happy, which took a huge weight off my broken spine. I've lived through a lot of strange and amazing experiences, highs and lows that are unimaginable to most people. But I find myself now in the most mundane of situations, and I cannot say that I am unhappy. Life is strange, but there is joy to be had living it. By Kerwit. That's a Mike <laughs> B. fanfic. By oh, that was something. That's that was something, man. Say, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's incredible. <laughs>